Fine. So uh, today's uh, seminar will be given by Dr. Damianos Yosifi. This is the first time that he speaks in our seminar and we are very glad for this. Let me tell you that uh, he uh, studied physics at the University of Thessaloniki where he finished with uh, excellent uh, in uh, 2011. Then he continued with a master degree at uh, the University of Amsterdam in the Netherlands. And then he returned back to uh, the University of Saloniki, finished his PhD. And uh, there we found him today. Uh, he's a research uh, fellow, a postgraduate uh, uh, fellow at the Department of Physics of the University of Saloniki. As you see also from the title, uh, he's uh, working in the field of, uh, let's say, cosmology, etc., and theoretical physics. Cosmological hyperfluids, torsion, and non metricity is the title of his today talk. So we may start. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Professor Patis and also the rest of the group for this invitation, uh, this opportunity to. Uh, give you uh, some idea of what I've been uh, working on. So uh, the title is Cosmological Hyperfluids. We are going to define what exactly we mean by that and how uh, they can be used in order to excite uh, space-time torsion non metrics We are also going to uh, touch upon these notions. Um, okay, so uh, let's start. Uh, so uh, a brief outline. Uh, we are going to uh, do some basic introduction into the uh, non-Riemannian geometry, the generalization of the Riemannian geometry, where we now have uh, also uh, torsion non-metricity. We are going to set up uh, the notation and conventions, etc. Then uh, we are uh, going to define uh, the notion of the hyperfluid and how it can be used to uh, excite torsion non-metricity in general and also in cosmological uh, 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 scenarios. Uh, okay, this is the generalization. And then we are going to apply uh, this result in a simple application to see how uh, the torsion non metricity affect the Riemann, uh, the Friedman uh, equations and see some uh, 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 how they, how do they modify it and how do they also modify the acceleration equation, etc. And then we're going to conclude and uh, discuss uh, further pro uh, projects. So the uh, basis of uh, this talk is, uh, uh, it, uh, is based on these uh, two papers. Uh, so let's start. So as we know, uh, given a manifold, we can uh, introduce two things uh, on it. So the first one is the metric tensor, which uh, helped us to define distances, measure distances, and also define dot products, etc. And we also have another object which is uh, uh, distinctly different, and this is the affine connection, which uh, allows us to define parallel transport and compare uh, vectors that uh, and tensors that live in different uh, tangent spaces. So these two notions are uh, a, priori not, uh, a priori not related. So uh, as usual, we have this definition for the covariant derivative and the metric tensor uh, uh, defines uh, the uh, length, etc. Uh, so uh, if we have a general manifold, this connection, uh, as uh, we already said, uh, does not depend on the metric. So in general, uh, it's not a Levis vita and uh, it also has no symmetry in the last uh, pair of indices. So uh, if we now form the uh, a commutator um, of the two covariant derivatives and acted on a scalar, then we have this tensor popping up, and this is uh, exactly the, the torsion tensor, is defined as the anti-symmetric part of the affine connection, and doing the same job now if we are allowed to um, act on a vector, then we have, as usual, this definition of the Riemann tensor, in terms of the affine connection. But now uh, let me stress out that this connection is the general one, which is not the Lepsi Vita. So the only symmetry that uh, this tensor now uh, has, the uh, Riemann tensor, is anti but by its very definition, is anti symmetry in its uh, last pair of indices. So, and many of the familiar identities that we have for Riemannian geometry uh, uh, no longer uh, hold. So, and we also have. 
uh, the non-metristic tensor, which expresses the failure of the uh, connection to be, covariant, uh, to be compatible with the metric. So, in other words, uh, the metric tensor is now uh, is, is not covariantly uh, conserved now. Uh, so we have these objects that uh, so we see that apart from curvature, we also now the space uh, now also has torsion and non-metristic. Uh, so out of uh, these two tensors, these, these uh, new tensors, torsion non metricity, we can uh, uh, define uh, new vectors by uh, taking contractions of them. So we have the torsion vector, which is this one. And also, uh, if we are in four dimensions, we have the torsion pseudo vector. We can contract with the Levy Civita uh, pseudo tensor okay, and construct uh, this vector. And we also have two uh, non metricity vectors. The first one is uh, Oftentimes called the vial vector, and this one has uh, uh, there is no uh, specific name for it. And the simplest form of, that we have for torsion and metricity are uh, vectorials. And as we showed in another uh, paper, there is a duality between these uh, two descriptions. So uh, if we have only vectorial torsion, we can map it to vial and metricity, and uh, the other way around but it only holds for uh, f of r theory. So, so uh, in general, uh, when we have the affine connection, uh, it's uh, an easy task to show that this connection, the general into a part, which is the usual levi civita one, which is uh, what we shall call the Riemannian part, plus non-Riemannian contributions. Non-Riemannian means uh, contributions that have to do with torsion non metricity So, uh, in this, uh, uh, we, we can always do this in composition, and this uh, add the additional uh, term that appears here, we call it sometimes N, and it's called the distortion tensor. So this combination is called the distortion tensor. It uh, uh, says how much the connection deviates away from the uh, Levis Vita one. And uh, this part uh, that has to do only with torsion is sometimes referred to as uh, contorsion. So having now this decomposition for the affine connection, we can always plug it uh, back into the de various definitions that we have and uh, express uh, every uh, tensor, scalar, et cetera, in terms of the Riemannian part plus non-Riemannian contributions. For example, we can do this if we go back to the definition of the Riemann tensor and uh, plug in uh, here the connection, this decomposition for the connection, and taking the contractions, we can uh, we can see that the Ricci uh, tensor uh, can be decomposed this way. So this is the Riemannian part, and these are the extra uh, parts that have to do with torsion non metric. Uh, so let uh, let us discuss uh, briefly the notion of torsion, what uh, the geometric uh, notion of torsion, what uh, uh, it really is. So if we take two curves, let's say. Uh, uh, this uh, C and uh, C uh, tilde, and we take uh, the tangent vectors for each, and now we take uh, this tangent vector and parallel transport it along uh, C tilde, and we do the other way around for the uh, other vector, the tangent vector to uh, C tilde, we parallel transport it along C. And uh, if we do some uh, calculations, we see that in the end, uh, the uh, vectors that we have here, uh, we take the difference. Uh, if there was no torsion, uh, what we have like in a, a normal Euclidean space, it would be zero. So these uh, two vectors will uh, be the same. But now if we have torsion, we can see that uh, the difference depends on torsion, uh, on this torsion tensor. And if we, have, we want to have a pictorial, let's say, representation, we can see uh, here clearly. So if we are, let's say for the simplest case, a two-dimensional space, so we have this vector u, we parallel transport it along uh, the x-axis. So uh, if, the torsion, if the space had no torsion, then we would have the same vector uh, here. And we also do this for u, we would have the vector uh, like so. But now if the uh, interesting, if the uh, space has torsion, these two vectors will rotate. So this uh, u tilde prime will be uh, something like that. And uh, this is the u prime. So we see this deviation vector, which has to do with torsion. So 
if uh, the space has torsion, uh, vectors will rotate when we uh, parallel transport, uh, transport them uh, uh, along the manifold. Uh, and we, in other words, we see that the torsion has cracked the parallelogram, in this case, the square, into a pentagon. So uh, torsion uh, cracks the parallelogram. Uh, now, uh, uh, for non-metricity, if we take uh, the simplest form, as we discussed, the value non-metricity, and we take a vector, uh, take uh, the length of a vector, so and parallel transported, what we have in uh, Riemannian geometry is the vector remains, the, the length remains the same. But now, if the uh, space has non-metricity, uh, if it's of the wide form, we see that the vector we end up with is this one. So we see there is a change in the length of the vector when we transport, them, uh, transport it in uh, the space. Uh, so uh, this is uh, the form it uh, has for vial non metricity. And we see that in general it's path dependent. Uh, but if the vial, this vial vector is exact, so uh, in this case only, it's a path independent and depends only on the endpoints. Uh, so, uh, and this is uh, just a simple uh, representation. We see we have a vector, we transport them, it, uh, uh, its uh, length uh, may change when we transport it uh, in the space. So, uh, this, uh, it, this is the part uh, that has to do with the geometry. So, now let's uh, dive into the physical part. So, uh, as we know, uh, we have uh, let's say when we want to we have th three most common, not the only uh, frameworks, but three, there are three uh, common uh, frameworks for gravity to formulate a, uh, gravity theories. So the first one is metric uh, gravity, uh, which is a part is a special uh, case of it. So we start in the metric gravity. What we have is we start off with a connection that is both torsionless and metric compatible. So it's uh, as we uh, as we saw with the previous uh, decomposition, then if we have vanishing torsion and metricity, the connection is always the Levi-Civita one. So if we are to write down a gravity theory, which will have a gravity uh, and a matter part, then both of these uh, uh, can have only dependence on the metric and its derivatives. So there is no uh, and the matter fields, of course. So the only degree of freedom is the metric. Uh, now. Uh, we know that uh, this is the, not the only theory that will keep Einstein equation. So we also have the teleparallel and symmetric teleparallel formulations, where now we start off with a connection. Now we impose vanishing curvature for the standard teleparallel and vanishing non metricity, and uh, gravity is mediated through torsion. And they also, uh, the same uh, game can be played for. Um, uh, non metricity so we uh, have the vanishing curvature and tonsure, and we have the symmetric teleparallel uh, formulation of gravity. So these are uh, all equivalent uh, when the uh, axion, the gravity action is linear in the rich scale. So we have deviations only when we go to f of r. Here we have the t scalar, f of t, etc. And we have uh, a generalized version of all of this, and this is metric affine gravity, which is uh, what we are going to be discussing. So this is the theory I'm uh, interested in. So in metric affine gravity, we start uh, with uh, an action that can depend both on the metric and its derivatives and the connection, and we make no a priori assumption about the connection. So the connection uh, is a general one, and uh, it's considered to be an independent field. So uh, in order to uh, find the relation with the metric, we have to uh, perform independent variations with respect to the metric and the connection. So the connection is a new dynamical field here. And uh, what is uh, uh, very important, and this is crucial for the discussion we will have below, is that uh, if the matter part, so the gravity part will depend on the connection if we are in a metric affine framework, but now the mother part, uh, if uh, when the mother part, let me say uh, another uh, way, if the mother part is independent of the connection, then we have the so-called Palatine gravity. So the connection is uh, uh, the, uh, the same, uh, let's say the conservation loss for matter, etc., are the same as in the metric case. But now if we have a matter uh, that couples to the connection, 
uh, we have many uh, new interesting results. And as we shall see, this uh, fact defines a new tensor, which is uh, uh, which ha which has to do with the microscopic properties of matter. And this is what we are going uh, to discuss. So um, again, we have uh, the connection and the metric as independent fields, and in order. Uh, to uh, get the field equations, we vary uh, with, the, uh, with respect to both of them and also for the matter field. And this is the holonomic approach. As we shall see, we also have uh, the differential form uh, approach. Uh, so the differential, what's uh, nice with differential forms is that it can be seen that uh, metric affine gravity is a gauge theory of gravity, where we now have the gauge potential, uh, gauge potential, which is the co-frame, which is dual to the usual frame here, and the linear connection. And the associated field strengths are torsion, curvature, and non-metricity, which are defined uh, in this way. And uh, here we have a variation principle that uh, the fields are the metric, the uh, co-frame, and the uh, linear connection. So now we see that uh, in this uh, approach, we have three uh, uh, degrees, three uh, dynamical fields, let's say. Uh, so we uh, can define three energy uh, tensors, energy related tensors, if we vary the matter part uh, of the action with respect uh, to those. So we have the canonical uh, or nether energy momentum. Here is an n minus one form if we are in n dimensions. Uh, it's defined this way. Uh, we have the metrical, uh, which is the variation with respect to the uh, metric, and we have the hypermomentum, which this is the uh, crucial part here, the hypermomentum that has to do, uh, it is known that it has to do with uh, the interesting properties of matter, such as spin, dilation, and uh, shear. So we have uh, these uh, three tensions. These are the sources that uh, will produce uh, uh, curvature, torsion, and non-metricity. So, uh, the, but uh, these uh, tensions are not quite independent, but they have to satisfy a certain conservation laws, uh, which come, the first one, uh, if we write it in the uh, language differential form, we have GL invariance. So this invariance uh, gives us this relation, about, uh, 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 this relation uh, in these tensors. And we also have different morse invariants in which uh, is translated in this uh, relation. So uh, we have uh, this conservation law. Now in the language of differential forms, uh, this might not be clear, the physical content. So we can always switch to a holonomic description, which is uh, in which we are most familiar with. So uh, these tensors take this form. So we have uh, the canonical is the variation of the matter part with respect to the VL bind. The metrical one is the energy classical, the uh, metrical energy momentum tensor that we all know, and it's just the variation of the matter part of uh, the Lagrangian with respect to the metric tensor. And now this is the crucial uh, uh, part. We have a matter that in general can depend on the affine connection as well. So we define this variation exactly to be this hypermomentum tensor. And uh, the conservation laws now for these tensors are uh, these ones. So the first one, it can be seen some, uh, something like a cons uh, conservation law for the hypermomentum. We see here, we have this modified covariant derivative acting here. It's the difference between these two tensors. And uh, if these two tensors are the same, then the uh, fluid, uh, is hypermomentum preserving, what we call hypermomentum preserving. So uh, the covariant derivative, this modified covariant derivative on the hypermomentum uh, vans. And we also have uh, this uh, conservation law, uh, which uh, we can see that these two can be combined. So if we take uh, 17 and um, substitute it back in here, uh, we can uh, arrive at this uh, conservation law. Here, uh, Tim, you use the energy, uh, ener the classical energy momentum tensor. Uh, so this is the Lebesgue Vita connection. Everything with tilde will be the Lebesgue Vita connection. So in GR, what we have is uh, this uh, covariant derivative is zero. So the energy momentum conservation 
we see now that this is not zero. If we have hypermomentum, we see that we have additional forces that have to do with the microstructure of matter, which is encoded in the uh, hypermomentum tensor. So now uh, uh, we have this setup and uh, we uh, make a question. So uh, we know the perfect fluid of uh, GR and uh, uh, we have this question. Can we generalize it in order to include the microscopic characteristics of matter? So we want a fluid that would be the generalization of uh, the perfect fluid, but with non-vanishing hypermomentum. So what uh, we want to do now is to have expressions for these energy tensors uh, uh, that will respect isotopy. So there will be a frame in which uh, the fluid will uh, look uh, isotropic. So uh, as we know, uh, let's uh, recall the perfect fluid description. So we have an energy momentum tensor, which is the same uh, with a canonical one, and it has the perfect fluid form, um, rho and p being the uh, uh, fluid's uh, density and pressure, and the uh, hypermomentum is identically advancing because the connection is not independent from the metric. So there is no violation with respect to the connection. So now we want to generalize this to allow for a non vanishing hypermomentum and to find uh, what is the most general form of this hypermomentum tensor that respects spatial isotropy. So uh, what uh, we have to do now is to impose this isotropy uh, by means of uh, vanishing a lead derivative, and we can find uh, the vanishing and non vanishing components. And what I have shown in this paper here is that the most general form that respects spatial isotropy uh, for the hypermomentum tensor is this one. So we see that we have five degrees of freedom, this pi, chi, psi, etc., in four dimensions. And uh, for dimensions different than four, we have four because this one is absent. So we will, uh, uh, we will only discuss the four dimensions. So we can say that in four dimensions, the uh, hypermomentum tensor is spanned by these uh, five functions, which uh, in general uh, can depend uh, uh, on time and on space uh, as well. So these are space uh, time dependent functions. And if we uh, impose also um, homogeneity, then they will be, uh, it will be only uh, there will be only functions of the time. But we shall. Uh, uh, see this in uh, what follows. So, uh, what we uh, take from here is that a hypermomentum has a general contributes five degrees of freedom. So, these five functions. Uh, but as we've already discussed, uh, hypermomentum can be decomposed into some physical parts. So, as we know, we have the spin part, which is uh, the anti symmetric part here. We have the dilation, which is the trace. And the CR is the symmetric traceless part. So as, uh, as we see, these uh, fields, they rearrange themselves to give, this is uh, one component of the spin part. This is the other one. And here we have essentially one component for the dilation and two components uh, for shear. So uh, as we will see this now, uh, we have this five uh, degrees of freedom uh, coming from hypermomentum, which will then act as sources that will produce um, torsion uh, and non-metricity. Uh, so let us uh, first uh, uh, postulate the perfect hyperfluid. So to recap uh, uh, everything. So uh, we have um, perfect hyperfluid, which is a generalized version of the perfect fluid notion of ZR for which the canonical uh, energy moment doesn't take this form. The metrical is this one. And we have also the hypermoment tensor, uh, which has this form. And these are subject. So now, if we take the conservation laws and have uh, and with this answer, this, so uh, the conservation laws we discussed uh, earlier take this form. So uh, we see here again how we have these modifications uh, due to. Um, uh, the microstructure. So, uh, as uh, what we can say, like briefly, is that the perfect fluid, perfect hyperfluid is perfect fluid with microscopic properties included. So, uh, 
If we now, so we have, uh, this is this is general, uh, here we only post uh, isotropy. So now if we also impose homogeneity, uh, so, and we take uh, the time components also project uh, along the spatial direction, we get uh, this uh, conservation law. See, this one is the modified continuity equation as we had in GR. In GR, we had that the uh, right-hand side will be uh, zero. So this is a continuity equation. We see now that it receives uh, uh, quite some uh, contributions from uh, this uh, microscopic properties. And we also have uh, two uh, uh, independent conservation loss for high momentum. So uh, as uh, we uh, now, because of the, we demanded the, of the great symmetry, let's say of the space, uh, we see that we have five uh, degrees of freedom, and only, but only two conservation laws. So we need to have some uh, equations of state among these variables. In the same uh, manner that when we have the continuity equation in GR, uh, we need to have an equation of state between the pressure and the uh, density, because we only have a continuity equation for the density. So uh, the same uh, is here. So we have the conservation law for these two variables of the hyper momentum. So we need to have uh, further equations of state among these variables in order to have a complete uh, system. Uh, so uh, let me also here, we see that uh, there appear some, uh, quite some symbols. This C, A, uh, we'll discuss what these are. So uh, we did this for hyper momentum. If we do the same for a portion of non metricity, uh, the components were known, but we uh, showed how this uh, can be uh, written covariantly in this uh, fashion. So we have phi uh, and uh, p um, uh, is the uh, functions that uh, uh, have to do with torsion, and also a, b, c uh, are the non-metric degrees of freedom. And this is the distortion. So uh, these are related as we uh, showed uh, in the beginning. Uh, these high psi, etc., are related to uh, A, B, C, etc., because we have the relation of the distortion person in terms of torsion and non metricity So, what we see now is we have two degrees of freedom for torsion and one, two, three for non metricity So, the five degrees of freedom that uh, we have for hyper momentum uh, will then act the five, two plus three degrees of freedom for torsion and non metricity this non remanent degrees of freedom. So we see that uh, it ex exactly matches up. Uh, the source, uh, source uh, this hyper momentum uh, tensor is exactly the one that we need to use in order to uh, accept this uh, non remanent degrees of freedom. And uh, let us now uh, uh, do a simple uh, example to see how these results uh, can be applied to study uh, physical cosmology. So the simplest uh, uh, case that we can have is to start with uh, the metric affine version of uh, uh, Einstein gravity. So we take, we start uh, off with um, a gravitational part, which is the user Einstein Hib uh, action. And we add uh, a matter part, which uh, we suppose uh, to be so we do the independent variations with respect to the metric and the connection. So uh, let me stress out here that uh, the first uh, set of equations, the variation with respect to the metric, uh, it seems to be uh, Einstein equations, but at this point, uh, they are really not Einstein equations because this uh, Ricci uh, tensor and Ricci scalar are the general uh, ones. So they have remaining parts plus no remaining contributions. So, uh, here we also have torsion non metricity. Okay, the form looks like, in uh, formalistically, they look like Einstein equations, but they are not because uh, these uh, uh, things here also have torsion non metricity. And we also uh, do the variation uh, with respect to the connection, and we have this equation, and we see here how this uh, hyper momentum sources torsion, and here is non metricity. Uh, so these are the equations uh, for this theory. So now if we uh, consider a homogeneous uh, background, so we, let's, let us consider the usual uh, 
FLRW uh, uh, background with uh, uh, Robertson Walker, line element, which is uh, this one. And then uh, we uh, plug it in here. Uh, if we uh, first concentrate on the connection field equations and we use the form of the hypermomentum that we have derived and also for torsion non metricity, so we use these forms for torsion non metricity and uh, this form of hypermomentum. Uh, this equation uh, will then give us uh, the form of the uh, torsion and non-metricity functions in terms of the sources will be the hypermomentum variable. So we see here that A, B, C, etc., which is non-metricity, phi and B, which is torsion. Uh, these functions are given in terms of uh, the hypermomentum variables. And uh, here, uh, these functions will only be the functions of time uh, in this uh, background. Uh, so, uh, if we now, so we now have uh, the relation between the sources and uh, the geometry, which is torsion non metricity. And if we now uh, go back to the uh, uh, con uh, to the metric field equations and take the components, then we can find the modified Friedman equations in the presence of uh, torsion non metricity. So uh, they look uh, like this. So the classical, let's say, is this one only. Uh, so we see that we get uh, quite some uh, contributions coming from um, uh, torsion non metricity. So uh, this uh, has to do with torsion non metricity, but they are related, as uh, we saw. Uh, to the uh, hypermomentum variables. And this is the acceleration equation. So we see that in general, we get a lot of contributions and it's not uh, totally clear what, uh, how these uh, additional degrees of freedom affect the cosmological evolution. We see here that in general, we have this uh, term, uh, but in some instances, it uh, disappears as we shall uh, see uh, now. So these are the general uh, Friedman equation, let's say, in terms of uh, in the presence of torsion non metricity. And uh, of course, the sources are supplemented by uh, the conservation laws we saw earlier. Now, if we, uh, so in general, we said that the hypermomentum encodes the spin, dilation, and uh, shear of matter. So now uh, let us uh, concentrate uh, only on shear because this is the uh, one that uh, hasn't been studied. Uh, uh, in the literature. So if we uh, consider a pure shear, hypermomentum preserving hyperfluid, hypermomentum preserving means that the canonical will be equal to the uh, uh, metrical. So we have this. And uh, if we impose vanishing spin and vanishing dilation, we have these relations. So at the end, the conservation laws uh, look like that, where we have also considered equation of state for uh, these two hypermomentum variables. So we see here. What's interesting is if you let me go back. If we see the conservation laws here, we see that they uh, they are coupled. So phi here we have uh, uh, p etc. So the hypermomentum degrees of freedom um, coupled to the classical let's say perfect fluid degrees of freedom. But in this case now we see that they have completely decoupled. So the uh, density evolves. Uh, independently from phi, and also uh, phi here, we see that we have no contributions. So if this is a special case, of course, the, uh, in this special case of the pure uh, CR hyperfluid, uh, the conservation laws have decoupled, so the non remaining degrees of freedom uh, do, not, uh, do not affect uh, the classical uh, evolution of the density. Uh, so now, we have these freedom equations, we have these conservation laws. And if we uh, express everything in terms of uh, uh, the sources of the right hand side of the freedom equation, we arrive at these equations. So uh, what we have now uh, some quite interesting results. So we see the linear term you see uh, have uh, disappeared, has disappeared, the linear term in. Um, the uh, Hubble uh, parameter. So we only have this term here, which is always positive. And uh, 
it, uh, it acquires, let's say, a description as an effective uh, density that has to do with the hypermentum that adds to the classical density. And also we see here uh, the acceleration equation. Here we see that only combination uh, phi, uh, phi squared appear. So uh, we see here that in general, we can have uh, this term will uh, accelerate the expansion uh, as long as this uh, W1 is uh, less than minus one. So uh, we see here that uh, this uh, non-Riemannian uh, effect, uh, this non-Riemannian effect can uh, accelerate the expansion. And uh, what is interesting is that if we have uh, an equation of state W1 uh, uh, is zero, then uh, in this case, we have deceleration, but uh, we see that the contribution, so if W1 is zero, and we take back here, so phi goes like one over A uh, to the third power. So uh, if we plug it in here, we will have uh, a term that goes something like a to the one over a to the sixth. So this is uh, exactly what we have uh, for stiff matter. So we see here that uh, a stiff matter component uh, can be extracted and it, it's not so exotic as it may, uh, uh, as, it, as it, it seems to be in the GR case. So here we see that uh, it's just a special part of the hyperfluid and uh, we have a stiff matter uh, contribution just uh, from uh, coming from the uh, microscopic uh, properties of matter from uh, this hypermomentum tensor. So this is quite interesting, I think. And uh, so I have discussed further solutions of these equations and also for more complicated cases in some other works, but uh, it's not relevant uh, to discuss it here. So uh, that's it. Let me uh, wrap up. Uh, what we have uh, discussed uh, here. So uh, we see that non riemannian geometry offers a lot of possibilities to study uh, theories of gravity. And metric affine gravity is a generalization of GR. It's a generalization of uh, Einstein-Cartan gravity, which is known to be a valid uh, theory uh, for gravity. And we have constructed, uh, we have postulated the perfect uh, cosmological hyperfluid, the perfect hyperfluid in general, and we have uh, in the applications of the uh, perfect cosmological hyperfluid. And uh, we saw with a simple example how uh, the internal structure of uh, matter can drastically uh, change the cosmological uh, scenarios. Uh, now, what remains to be seen, there are many things that uh, we can look uh, now, but the first one would be cosmological solutions. This one I worked a little bit, but there are many, many things that uh, uh, need to be found. So what would be interesting would be uh, to find the non-relativistic limit of this perfect hyperfluid and see how uh, the uh, continuity and the Euler equations uh, are modified it because this microstructure. So uh, because of the hypermomentum, we have extra terms in the Euler and uh, continuity equations and see possible physical interpretation of uh, these terms. And uh, in the end, to uh, see how these uh, hypermomentum variables are related uh, to uh, give some bounds on these hypermomentum variables uh, by measurements uh, from observations, etc. So uh, that's it, thank you. So thank you, thank you very much for the interesting talk. It is time for uh, some uh, questions, if they exist. Let me let me ask you something. Okay, whatever uh, uh, you you presented us is for the description of the cosmological fluid, right? So uh, my question is, uh, what? Uh, how one comes up with the necessity to include torsion in the Friedman equation? So, what uh, is uh, the, the what uh, what are we trying to 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 understand by including torsion, or what uh, what was the necessity to do that? Uh, yes, uh, in GR uh, we have no hypermomentum, so we know 
uh, that uh, there will be no torsion, uh, neither torsion nor non-metricity. So if we now want to generalize GR to include uh, the uh, interesting properties of matter in microscopic, this, uh, in order to do this, we have to have a non-vanishing hypermomentum tensor. This is exactly my, my question. Why do we need to generalize that? Until now, we have something without torsion. Now we include torsion. Why? What is the necessity for doing that? Uh, I mean, like if we take Einstein Cartan, uh, we know that uh, if we have a spin, then this will generate torsion. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this is a generalization when we now have more properties, spin and direction and shear, and this now can uh, excite torsion and non-metricity. Dilation and the shear parts has to do also with the non-metricity. So uh, yes, that, that, that's why they appear. Okay. And is there any other physical system where uh, uh, we can apply that? Or is it just the cosmological fluid? Uh, yes, yes, that's the interesting part. Uh, if we relax the uh, uh, homogeneity assumption, then will be space uh, time functions. And then we could see how the Euler and uh, continuity equations uh, are modified because of this. Uh, uh, yes, because we have extra terms and uh, something like extra forces. And uh, I think this uh, work has to be done because in this way we uh, can have a clear uh, physical meaning of these uh, hypermomentum variables to see how they modify uh, the various uh, terms. Okay. So let me see if there is anybody else who wants to ask something. Yeah, Nisia. Yeah. In continuation to to Pablo's question, have you tried to fit uh, rotation curves of galaxies or the cosmological constant? I mean, find any applications of what you describe in the dark matter, dark energy, so on. Have you tried that? Will you do that or? Uh, yes, yes, these are all uh, uh, prospects to do later because uh, I just uh, formulated this one and now there are like many, many things that uh, we can see. Uh, I have studied only some cosmological aspects, so there are many open things. But uh, yes, they may have uh, interesting results also, and the things that you suggested, yes, yes, for sure. Uh, we, we know that... Uh, 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 no, no, I haven't done, I haven't done it. Uh, uh, the first thing I wanted to do now is to uh, find these uh, modifications to the Euler and uh, continuity equations, but uh, it can also be applied, yes, to many other things. And uh, it, ha I mean, this uh, calculation uh, really that we uh, we need to uh, have something uh, more uh, with these calculations because they will help us understand more of these hypermomentum variables. Because at the moment, okay, we know that spin is a part, etc. but regarding the CR part and the dilation, there is really, uh, it's quite obscure, let's say. Uh, any other question? Okay, I, I don't think that, I don't see any uh, hand raised, then, uh, so uh, then we are done. Um, we thank the speaker again. Huh? So thank you. And thank you. Okay. Uh, sorry. Sorry. Okay. Sorry. There, uh, there is some question here. Mm. I just have seen it. Yes. Please go ahead, uh, Mr. Zapartas. Sorry, it, it was not a question. It was a, it was a clap for uh, thank you. Thank you, Dama. Thank you, thank you. Okay. So, bye bye. Uh, 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 do you want me to send you the uh, talk? Uh,